Good morning. Um, I'm Erin Mahalik. Uh, welcome to our Crest BD Talk BD event, uh, which this week is focused on supporting family relationships during Corona times. Um, I'm joining you from the Sunshine Coast of British Columbia. This is a special initiative for us. We are holding this as a UK-Canada partnership today. Um, hence, it's 11 o'clock in the morning for us, Pacific time. Uh, you can see that it's a beautiful day here. The sun is shining down on us. Um, I'll introduce myself first and then pass you over to our next presenters. Um, I am a professor in psychiatry at the University of British Columbia, uh, the leader of the Crest BD team, um, and an avid gardener and mushroom hunter. With that, I will pass you over to Fiona. Hi, guys. Um, so I'm Fiona Lobben. Um, I'm a professor of clinical psychology in the Spectrum Centre at Lancaster University, which is in the UK. Um, and I'm also a clinical psychologist in the local NHS Mental Health Trust. And I live at home with my two teenage kids who might well crop up in some of the things that we talk about today in terms of managing families. Um, and I, my hobbies are kind of getting out into green spaces. So anything to do with outdoor swimming or mountain biking, that kind of thing. Uh, and I'm Victoria Maxwell. I've been a member of Crest since its inception, um, since probably 2007. Uh, I live with bipolar disorder, anxiety, and psychosis. Uh, so I'm a peer researcher. Uh, and I also am a, my full-time gig is a mental health uh, educator and keynote speaker and performer. And uh, I do mental health coaching as well. Uh, and then what I do for fun is I love running in the trails. I live in the Sunshine Coast like Erin, and uh, we got a dog just a little while ago, which you may hear in the background. So if you hear barking, that is uh, darling little Pedro. Uh, and uh, yeah, I like going running in the trails and uh, I often going hiking with my husband. So, yeah. Victoria, being as this is a family focused event, I'm gonna take moderator's privilege and tell you that I think most of my family in the UK are joining this. I can see them on Facebook, including my mummy, Arena. Um, and this is kind of funny in that she's been watching the last uh, events that we've been doing together and she's a little bit in love with you. In fact, to a point of kind of annoyance in that she keeps saying to me when we catch up things like, well, I'm, I'm baking again because Victoria said it's a good idea in the last webinar and I sit there and I think, mom, I've been telling you such and such is a good idea for years and you never listened to me when I suggested it. Yeah. Well, you're the uh, biggest fan. So. Well, that, oh, well, that's hilarious because oftentimes it's the same thing, you know, when we're told from outside our like primary relationship or, you know, loved ones, it's like, I don't listen. And then when a friend says it, it's like, oh, that seems like such a good idea. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. So this is an initiative brought to you by Crest BD. I uh, know that we are a research network um, in Canada focused on supporting people with bipolar disorder specifically, um, but for these events we've really kind of broadened that out and we'll be talking today about a topic area that I think is affecting most of us uh, in some way or another. And it's a really wonderful opportunity to um, continue to build a very strong relationship with the Spectrum Center, which is based in Lancaster in the UK. Spectrum, um, it's like a really kind of like a sister center to Crest in many ways, and that they really are one of the stellar groups internationally who does what we do, which is really prioritizing working hand in hand with people who live with mental health conditions to do research and to help access to care in a different way. So really wonderful to have uh, Fiona joining us as well from that group. Just a few, thing, a few things on technical stuff. You'll be either joining us today by a Zoom or a live stream via Facebook. When we come to the question and answer session, um, thank you first of all to everybody who's given us questions beforehand through the anonymous survey that we run via the Crest BD website. Uh, we'll be dealing with those. You can also uh, enter your questions into Zoom or you, into Facebook um, and we will um, look forward to answering as many as we can. So with uh, that, I will pass over to our main presenters for today. Okay, so I guess one of the things that might be helpful just to start off with is having a little think about 
um, kind of why this topic of families is so important right now. And obviously um, we're in a, a period of lockdown and in the UK we've just been told this is going to be extended for another three weeks. So it's kind of put a lot of restrictions on our movement and the consequences of that might be quite varied for different people. So for some people that means there might be more time with family that they're not used to, so forced to spend quite um, close time with people. Or it might be that actually we're not able to see important family members who generally we get support from. And for some people, work might have stopped completely. They might have been furloughed from their job. Or some people, they've actually got more work on and they're trying to juggle the stresses of being at home with all the family and deliver on their work. So actually, there's quite there's incredibly high levels of anxiety around at the moment. And there's, there's numerous surveys that have been done that kind of show that this is the case. And it means that there's lots of people in kind of fight or flight kind of mode where um, you know, where it's a it's a bit of a recipe for for family troubles. And I guess, but it is worth also flagging that there are some positive outcomes from this. So I've heard quite a lot of people saying, you know, despite the real tragedy that's happening, that they've actually really valued some of the time to spend more time with their family, or maybe to be a little bit more around for the kids and things. So it's having really different consequences for different people. And I guess in terms of managing all this, the, the social networks that we have are really, really crucial. So families are one of them and there are so there are our closest social networks. But thinking more broadly, we've got things like all the scientists who are suddenly having to come together and work together to develop vaccines and antibodies and antigen tests. And we've got all the NHS staff as a network around us who are working together to literally save our lives or the health services around the world um, and, I, and certainly in our area and I'm sure this is true in other places we've got people volunteering to walk dogs and pick up prescriptions and so there's some lovely examples of, of social networks really coming together and our families are kind of just one of these but it's a, obviously often the most important one so what we're going to do I think is try and just talk about some of the things that might be important in in um, relieving some of the tension in family relationships and making the most of this time. But I think um, before we get into that, I, there's just a few things that I would sort of highlight as top tips. So the first one is that whatever strategies you try, the, the important thing is to set, accept that at times will go wrong. So it is true that we, you know, these are unusual times. We will shout at each other, the kids will fight, the dinner will be burnt. You'll get behind on your jobs. You'll take on a massive DIY or gardening project and then completely regret it. And I think just accepting it from the outset is really, really, really important. So yeah, I, think I, I, would, I would say, Fia, it's like uh, we were talking before where it's like adjusting our expectations. And this is the one place where if we lower our expectations, we actually might have a better experience. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I've certainly noticed, you know, there's, the kind of these people who are trying to become the, the fittest family on the block or hot house the children to get into the top university or, you know, there's almost like a pressure to use this time really productively. And actually, I think that's probably not the best strategy because most importantly, it's actually going to be a relatively short period of time. So we don't need long term strategies. What we need is how do we best get through the next few weeks, you know, in, in the most enjoyable, peaceful way. So that would, I guess, would be my starting point. And obviously this situation is really difficult for everyone, but it is particularly, we're, we're thinking about particularly why it might be challenging for people who are either living with bipolar disorder or who are supporting someone in their family with this condition. And in thinking about sort of, um, you know, what we might talk about today, the, the psychological evidence would suggest that focusing on three key things might be useful. So the things that we're going to cover in this intro bit are, the first one is thinking about the emotional atmosphere in the home and really thinking, how can we make this as chill, positive and warm as possible? And the reason for this is that, that we know from, from, um, research evidence that, that living in a really highly stressful kind of um, critical sort of environment can lead can be a predictor of relapse and that's not to say that you know being in a family way 
you know, certainly our family, we express our emotions, including our frustrations very vocally, but it's important to really counterbalance that with positivity and warmth. So, um, you know, we know that's important. So we're going to talk a bit more about that. Um, the second one is about maintaining healthy routines and the role that family plays in that. And the third one is how we make the most of social supports. And we're going to think about our family and friends, but also healthcare professionals and other people with lived experience who might be able to help us. So I don't know if this is a good point for Victoria to come in and say something maybe about her, her situation in lockdown and yeah, no, that's, I, I think, and I took um, that point that you said that uh, it's, there's a variety of situations that people will find themselves in. And I think with that, uh, different strategies need to be put in place. So for myself, it's my husband and I, and we don't have kids. And so I know in particular, um, if you're someone with bipolar disorder um, and you have kids uh, and you're working remotely from home, you've got a, additional responsibilities now besides just your regular work, besides change, besides now taking care of kids and finding a way to set boundaries. So I think for, regardless, it's really about being kind to ourselves about really just not expecting us to know how to do this well, just finding our, our, our way and giving ourselves a lot of wiggle room for mistakes and forgiving ourselves, forgiving others. Um, and I really like that part about um, maybe counterbalancing any of the negativity with some positivity. Um, I think that generally, regardless of the situation you're in, and particularly in my situation, um, I think it's an unusual for all of us to either, like you said, be in close quarters with someone, whether, you know, uh, our loved ones, whether we're supporting someone with a bipolar disorder, because I was going through a really rough time over the past, probably at least two weeks for sure, but the last probably couple months. And it's equally difficult in a very different way for the people who are supporting uh, those of us who have the illness. So for my husband, how does he take care of himself and how do we create a situation at home so that we both have space? And so uh, if there's kids involved or if you're apart uh, or whatever your responsibilities, it's really sort of finding that um, uh, almost secret sauce recipe. And so hopefully the things that you'll be talking about and I can share from my unique experience, which might not apply to everybody, um, we'll find those different elements that you can put into place or think about and maybe shift a bit so you can take a, one nugget away that helps um, support you in a better way. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. And I think one of the important things to flag at this point is just, you know, some of the things that I'm going to suggest are, are strategies that, have, uh, that families have found, other families have found helpful, but obviously every family is different and it might be that some of these things are not applicable to you or you've tried them and they didn't work but hopefully we can we can between us all come up with some things that you just take maybe one idea away and give it a go yeah. and, and the nice thing about families is because they're a system you know one little change in that system can have really big knock-on effects throughout the system so you don't need to to solve a big problem actually just just thinking of one thing to try might be um, a good a good way to go with this. So I'm going to start with just sort of suggesting some things that might help with this idea of creating a, a positive chill atmosphere in the house because it sounds so lovely and actually <laughs> it's really difficult. <laughs> um, and, and so my, my, the first suggestion is that, that actually as human beings we're very we're very um, good at identifying problems and, and we, we pick them up and we want to solve the problem. And, and it's probably an evolutionary thing. You know, we survive more if we can spot the, the predator that's arriving. But actually, we're not so good at spotting all the things that are going well. And actually, if we can really try and shift that by deliberately noticing the positive things that are going on and making a real effort to point them out, that can have a huge impact on the atmosphere. And I'm gonna give you an example for this. So this is this afternoon, my kids decided, so they're, they're at home and I'm trying to do work and 
and basically, <laughs> so, so I went downstairs and they decided to do baking. So I go in and the kitchen, so I've spent a bit of time this morning cleaning the kitchen. I go into absolute chaos. Um, and it would have been really easy to kind of go, oh, the kitchen, you know, I've kind of done it, all this work in the kitchen and now you've created a mess. But they had done baking. So <laughs> I had to make a real effort to go, it's brilliant that you've done baking and kind of focus on the fact that there was cakes rather than that I then had to spend the time cleaning up the kitchen. And, and by doing that, what we're doing is kind of pulling out the, the good things and, and rewarding that behavior. And actually over time, it shapes the behavior. So it's not that I'm not, you know, not bothered by the kitchen, but I think it's just choosing what we focus on and what we choose to bring out. Yeah, and, and one thing I really like about that too is, is that that's something within our control. And I think in this time of such incredible change and change that's being thrust upon us and threats that we can't really see and we don't know the, the end game and all this kind of stuff is that that's the one thing that we have control of. So you, you, you didn't have control over what your kids did. I mean, I, I, yeah, no, barring <laughs> handcuffing, to the, handcuffing them to the dishwasher, I guess, or something. Um, but I, and, and I did that this morning, actually, because I noticed that for some reason over the last day or so where I was just, my mind kept going to the negative, like what, what, um, what I didn't feel good about, or just whatever it was. And so this morning where I, I took just time to note three things that you know the science behind gratitude and, and things like that but also I think it's really important about noticing the the good things in the family system about that that's working um, and it it really makes a difference and I I know that there's some science behind that you know that it's almost like a kindling effect that that positive emotion can ripple out um, not necessarily to other people, I'm sure it does, but also just to ourselves and it increases it. And, um, and that is what that sent that little bit of sense of control, um, I think, in a time where we have, where we can feel like we have so little control is what's very helpful for me, particularly uh, with someone with bipolar disorder, where my emotions seem to just be going up and down, up and down. Um, mm. It gives me a little semblance of stability. Yeah. And, and I think you're right that that whole idea of also looking for positives in the family environment, including so when we feel really annoyed with people, one of the things that can really help is just remind yourself about why you like them. <laughs> and and I, I always think when, when I get annoyed with my husband, I always think, but he puts the bins out every week. And actually, I hate doing that job. And, and no matter how cross I am, that just helps because yeah. it, make, it reminds me of all the, you know, the reason why I love him. <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's a garbage cans for us here in north america yeah. Yeah. britain garbage cans here <laughs> you'll, have to, you'll have to translate for me erin yeah. so so it was interesting as well victoria that you were saying about you know things that we can control so so one of the other things that actually we can control that i think can also really change the atmosphere in the house is just thinking about how we spend our time and really importantly in families what we're talking about so it's really easy and i've done this and certainly early on i did a lot of this it's easy to scroll through endless news apps to talk about covid19 a lot of the time to update yourself constantly um, and actually re and and i guess to just noticing the impact that that actually has on the tone in the house is really important particularly with kids because they, they really listen in on everything and they're picking, even if you're talking with your partner, they're picking it up. And I think actually just focusing, thinking, okay, what, we can't control COVID and, and obviously it's, it's devastating when we read the news, but maybe it's a time to think about positive things closer to home that maybe are really present that we can bring people's attention to. So thinking about the beautiful weather, the flowers in the garden, the skylarks have just arrived around here. So, you know, just make an effort to say to the to family, oh, you know, can you hear the skylarks? Aren't they beautiful? And really drawing our attention to the positive things. And, and like you said, letting our bodies feel that emotion that comes with those things and really letting it kind of wash through us um, and, and just shifting our focus in that in that way. Yeah, and I and I know for Gordon myself, it's about getting the right 
the accurate information, the amount of information that will help support us to make good decisions, but not so much where it starts to get into that rumination, that real obsessiveness, where then all of our anxiety, both of us start to, to go up. And so, and I think uh, in one of the previous uh, talk BDs, we, I was talking about and measuring sort of the effectiveness of what is working and what isn't. And so finding out if, you know, noticing those small things uh, make a difference in how the atmosphere is. And I, I certainly find that because the more that I do notice things around me, like on the runs I go, really brings me back to the present and also just gives me a, a sense of well-being and, uh, and sort of being uh, grounded. Yeah. So, so there's two more things I would highlight around making this chill, positive atmosphere in the house. So one is really thinking about our space. So we all need different levels of contact and different amounts of time on our own. And, you know, some of us are introverts and we need, we need more time on our own. Some are extroverts and want the whole family to come together. And I guess just thinking about are there times when um, it's helpful to have everyone together, like maybe around in our house, it's meal times and we, we try and spend that together, but also respecting the need for space. And again, this is particularly important with teenagers. So they just need more time on their own. It's normal for them to go and disappear into their bedroom. There is such a lot going on for teenagers in terms of, you know, their brain development. And, and it really strikes me that uh, this COVID-19 and the lockdown is, I think has hit teenagers possibly harder than any other group. If you think about, you know, what's happening in their lives in terms of the, it's, their education, their career development, their romantic relationships, their peer relationships, that actually they might find it more difficult to talk about, but that, that is a particular group that I think we need to be very aware of, of their needs for both time and um, space. And I think the second um, thing that I was gonna mention was just this, you know, really um, ex being kind so to yourself and to others, but you know, don't underestimate the power of an apology. So when it goes wrong and you've lost your temper and you've shouted, actually just saying sorry really early can, can be so helpful in stopping things escalating. So we can just practice doing it. Have a, say sorry, have a hug and, and let it go. And I think it, that sounds so simple, but it can make a huge difference. All I can say is yes. <laughs> <laughs> because, because both Gordon and I have, you know, whatever stuff has come and gone or whatever, and we both look or whatever, and it's either that yeah, sorry, or can we start the morning over again? Yeah, let's do that, you know, that kind of stuff. So, and uh, yeah, yeah. So I'll just, I'll just uh, echo that I totally relate. I, I don't know if I can add anything to that. Well, I think can we start the day over again? It's so perfect because these are unusual days. So we yeah. don't have to solve these problems. We can just say, oh, you know, I didn't get that one quite right. Let, can we try <laughs> that again? Because we don't need long-term solutions. Yeah. So yeah, that sounds like a great phrase. Can we start? Yeah, the day? yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess one of the, the challenges to this is, you know, we, there are problems that, that we do sometimes have to solve as families. So it's one thing to focus on the positives, but what happens when there is something that, that keeps coming up that's a problem that actually, does need addressing. Um, and I think the, the way to kind of decide whether it does need addressing is, is really to ask yourself, is this a problem that can wait? Like, is, is this a problem that's been there within the family for a long time and is now really the best time to address it? So long-term relationship problems, long-term um, you know, challenges with kids. I think if it can wait, it's probably a good idea to wait. But if it does need addressing, then I guess, um, you know, thinking about maybe taking problems one at a time and approaching the, them in, in a sort of fairly structured way. So thinking about allocating a specific time to discuss the problem and maybe inviting the family to, to come together to do that, um, you know, so that everyone's involved in how that might happen. And trying to kind of specify exactly what the problem is and agreeing as a group what might be a, a, a potential solution to try. So getting lots of ideas from everyone, agreeing what you're going to have a go at, and then thinking about when you're going to review whether that solution's working or not. 
So rather than ruminating on it all the time and it becomes a constant part of the conversation, you might say, okay, let's, let's try for a week doing it differently. Um, and so like to give you an example, um, we, we started off with, okay, how are we gonna occupy the kids while they're not at school? And they started off with this half hourly timetable that was written up on a blackboard of the kitchen that didn't work at all. And so eventually it's evolved to become, as long as they do a bit of exercise and they learn one thing a day, whatever it is, it can even be how to bake a different cake, then the rest of the time, you know, they can do their own thing. But it took quite a few iterations to get to that solution. And it took um, all of us to kind of, you know, agree a way forward and then reflect on how well is this working? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I can definitely relate to that idea of sort of the problem solving and, and this probably just goes down to basic communication skills is that uh, if there is a problem that needs to be solved to do it when tempers aren't flared up, right? So we might acknowledge, like I might acknowledge with my husband that, okay, we got to deal with this, but we need a cooling off period and then we can come back and then we can discuss it. Um, and I think that's really important to recognize perspective that this you know that any that the things that can wait they can wait and it's still it's okay it's not about it that's not necessarily avoidance that's actually good problem solving right there <laughs> yeah. yeah absolutely and I think that idea of not trying to solve the problem when you're when you're in it and you're kind of angry or frustrated because our ability to think up potential solutions or to see the problem from the other person's perspective just becomes so restricted yeah. And actually, if we can calm down and, you know, do it in a, in a, at a different time, we become much more creative and much more empathic about how we try and solve the problem. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so, so hopefully that's given some um, people some little tips that they might take something away from to try and create kind of more positive, chill atmosphere in the house. And we're happy to take questions about, about that. So I was going to just move on um, to have a think about the role of families in maintaining our social and circadian rhythms. And, and I think by this, I mean kind of the, the time scales in which we do things in the day. So we're talking about our, our sleep cycles. So when we go to bed, when we get up, but also our social cycles. So when we eat, uh, when we have social contact, and, and actually, this is really important because all of these rhythms impact on our hormones and we know that our hormones impact on our mood. So if we're thinking about bipolar disorder and trying to regulate our mood, one of the really useful ways to do this is to try to regulate our social and circadian rhythms. And families can be really, really important in trying to create routines because if you're in a family where everybody's got a different routine, everyone's going to bed and getting up at completely different times, meal times aren't at a fixed time and people just wander into the kitchen and eat at any time, it can actually be really difficult to, to generate a routine. So if you're trying to support someone in the family who has um, bipolar, then it can, I think just as a family, you can all really support them by trying to create some regular bedtimes, regular getting up times, um, you know, getting dressed in the morning. Often you kind of get up and think, well, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> so, you know, what, what's the point? And I've done a few days with my jammies on in front of um, the computer, but actually you don't feel very good. And, and your body is kind of feeling like it's dressed for bed and it wants to go to sleep. And so, so really trying to stick to that, get dressed in the morning um, as if you're going to work. You might not want to kind of you know, you, know, you might not want to put full makeup on, but you know, whatever, whatever you might. So whatever works for you. Um, and also how you spend your time. So, you know, making sure that your day has a, this real mixture of kind of pleasurable activities that you do purely for fun, that might be creative or might be um, spending time in nature, but also has some activities in which are about achieving something. Because actually we all have a need to feel that we've achieved something with the day. So this mixture of what's called pleasure and mastery is actually really important in terms of regulating our mood. And a really simple way of doing this could be when you, know, when you get up in the morning, just think of maybe three things you want to get done with your day. And, it, and they can be really simple things like FaceTiming my mom or writing an email or you know, whatever it is. And then just 
at the end of the day, try and reflect on, oh yeah, you know, I did those three things. And, and it just gives you that sense that actually you have achieved something with the day and it's easy to dismiss the days and think I haven't really done anything. So I think having that kind of structure can, can be quite helpful. I don't know if that's something that, that's relevant in your house. Yeah, no, it definitely is. I mean, and, it, and it's taken a while. And so I really, particularly when I was feeling anxious and depressed, Gord really helped support me in um, reminding me of the routine that works for me. And so uh, we both had to, um, you know, get really more uh, settled on when I, like when I go to bed, when I get up, I made a commitment to not wear my house coat during the day because <laughs> I really love it. Um, and those sorts of things. And then really picking even just one thing that I know I enjoy to do uh, during the day. Um, I know we've got uh, quite a few um, questions in. Erin, do you wanna jump into some questions and then we can uh, go to the third point that Fiona was gonna talk about? I I don't would, think... Yeah, I think that would be a great strategy if you're okay with that at this point. Um, I... We've had more questions on this particular topic than any in any previous event. So thank you to everybody who's, uh, who's given us such great questions so far. Let's start with this one. Um, I have a family member with bipolar who's very negative about coronavirus. Um, they're understandably upset. Um, you know, they're not getting social distancing. They're frustrated. Um, but this person is worried that that negativity is going to impact their mood state negatively in turn. Any tips on that one? Fee, do you want to take that? Sure, yeah. Um, so I, I think one of the things that struck me from your question was that you said um, that they're understandably quite upset. And I think that that's actually a really important word, that understandably. So it sounds like they they kind of, they need to express these feelings and, and allowing people to do that is really, really important. But it can get to a point where you're kind of, and it sounds like this is the point that the, the person asking the questions out where you're you're kind of wondering how useful this is and whether it's not just bringing someone down or it's it, it can kind of feed your own negativity and you get kind of wound up and it brings your mood down so i guess one option is to think you know is there a way of just um allowing that that expression of frustration but then trying to kind of just bring some balance into it so um obviously it is, you know, things are terrible at the moment and there's a lot of tragedy happening. So it, this can be quite difficult, but maybe just thinking about balancing some of the more negativity and also asking about other things that are happening in the day so that you're putting some of these events into a bigger picture um, rather than just keep following the train of thought, which is focusing on, on the difficulties. Yeah, I mean, and for, for me, either if I'm uh, doing that or if, if someone is um, expressing those things, a lot of times what I find too is just asking, um, what do you need? And, or if someone says, what do I need? So it gives me a sense that uh, my feelings are okay. Um, and also that I'm not powerless in the situation or there may be aspects where I'm powerless, but what would, what would, it gives me a, a sense where I can sort of activate myself to say, okay, maybe what I need is accurate information or, you know, I just need to vent, but I'll, I'll vent for like five minutes or something. So really identifying specifically. And then it sort of also gives, I think a break for the person who's supporting uh, an end time to it so that yeah. they know that they can set a boundary. Yeah. And, and actually there has been such a lot of, you know, if you read the news, some of it, obviously it's reporting on the, you know, the number of deaths, number of people with the virus, etc. But there are also these amazing stories of people who, you know, communities coming together. There's, there's a guy in the UK, I don't know if you guys are getting this, who's is he 99 or 100? He's, he's just raised five million pounds in the NHS and going up and down his garden. And, you know, like, it's really heartwarming things as well. So it is really important that we that we can balance those those things, because some of them give you a real kind of sense of the beauty of humanity as well. Yeah. Next question is actually almost the polar opposite to this. It's really interesting. It's about hypomania specifically. So I'm currently in lockdown with my family, aunt, uncle, cousin, 
I'm experiencing an episode of hypomania following a double whammy bereavement of both my mom and dear friend um, dying. I've moved from my own apartment to the family farm, got a week to go. It's most challenging, this person says they're doing okay right now, but this is the greatest challenge they've ever faced. So big family, one house, hypomania. Gosh, okay, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, it sounds like this has just been, uh, uh, you know, so many things happening at one time. So I think the first thing is acknowledging how difficult this situation is and that actually it sounds like this person has a lot of insight into their own you know current mental health state and, and potentially has a lot of understanding about what kind of strategies they've used in the past that have been helpful or you know the kind of things that they they know can can um help them when they were in this state but the kind of things that you know to reiterate are things around sleep and routine are particularly important when people are becoming elevated and and often it isn't what you want to do because you you know the energy is flowing and maybe you are having lots of ideas and feeling quite excited as well with some of this kind of dr drive and energy but just trying to kind of take the days one step at a time and maybe try to to stagger what you're doing and focusing on some quite concrete engaging tasks that can have a kind of calming effect because we're trying to think how to to just bring some of that energy level down and to get into um into a, a, a bit of a gentle routine but it's really difficult um and i guess it's it, it depends how well the rest of the family know you know are familiar with these these signs and how to best support you to do that yeah, and when I first heard it, the immediate thing was um, asking yourself how your sleep is, and is there a way to regulate your sleep a bit more? Um, and for me, when I get into that place, I need to be really ultra honest with myself around how am I, or if I am, um, uh, sort of feeding the hypomania, or am I actually... Um, calming it and being really gentle with myself, but knowing that if I, um, especially since it's an unusual circumstance and situation that the consequences, if I don't take care of it now, um, could propel me into a mania. And so um, I think it's great that you're asking the question because potentially it means that you know that you want to take care of yourself and um, you, you want to sort of stay at least in the hypomanic state or, or calm or even a, a calmer state. So all those tools that allow you to stay calm, it may be taking space from your family. It may be not having certain kinds of conversations or setting boundaries. Um, for me, when I'm in that place, uh, it's sort of like those, those things that can contain the energy. And oftentimes that energy starts to go way on itself. Um, and so it's sometimes like fee, you were saying, not necessarily doing the creative things that I love to do, but finding pleasure in, uh, different kinds of things. So it might be, uh, I practice Qigong. Um, so I, I do that and, uh, walking instead of running. Um, it's, uh, playing with my dog, but not necessarily running with my dog, those kind of things. Um, and then, uh, and then just monitoring and seeing where it goes. And then if it really starts to escalate, that's when I try to contact my um, healthcare provider. So. Next question. I live with my girlfriend and my dad. Um, this person, their girlfriend is staying indoors and protecting themselves, but their dad is not. Um, they say that uh, they're showing him the statistics every day, but he's not taking precautions and it's creating some strife and it's also affecting their relationship with their girlfriend. And so the question is about how to manage the difference of what people are doing in terms of social distancing. And attitudes towards that and risk perceptions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Fee, do you have comments on that? I have. I, I wanted to pass this this difficult well, one to you. You know, I, actually, I, I had this very situation with my parents. So my mom and dad lived together, and my mom was getting quite anxious about the situation, and, and had decided to stay in because they're in their late seventies. And my dad was a bit more blasé and thought that going and playing golf was fine, and you know that kind of thing. And so, and actually, we kind of addressed it by, you know. So he, he was quite blasé about his own risk, but when you pointed out he was actually putting my mom at risk as well, then he found it easier to regulate his behaviour for her concern. So it's hard to know in this situation wh whether that, that is relevant, but I guess sometimes if people, you know, we, we do tend to feel a bit um, invincible. So Well, some people do, and so they kind of don't really believe they're going to get it. But if you can point out that actually for the other people in the family, this is really important because their anxiety is going up and, and, and you know, they're, they're worried about it. And sometimes people are better able to help others than they are to help themselves. Um, so that, that could be one um, way in. I think there are some really interesting um, um, sort of stories that are available on the internet about people who have also been challenging these statistics. So one of the big statistics that came out early on was that young people weren't as susceptible. And actually that proved to be quite a dangerous message to give, I think, because even if they're not as likely to die, that you know, there have been cases of people who have become very unwell and died. And also they are potentially spreading the virus. So I do think that the, there's something about, um, you know, that how the statistics are presented that have, that have potentially um, been not so helpful in this context. But yeah, and as you were th saying that, something that came up for me is that um, discussing sort of how the father is um, not, let's say, different in his approach to how he's not doing social distancing or physical distancing or something, and maybe finding a compromise. I mean, it's really difficult. I mean, like you said, if you're both all living in the same house um, and you'd be putting someone else at risk but if the individual still sort of you know just saying you know i'm i don't see it i want to do this i want to do that maybe the kind of things the activities that he could do would be at a lower risk so it's like um my husband and i one of the things that um he really enjoys and needs is contact with his guy friends and so finding a way that he can be out. So they go and they go to this huge wide open space nature wise, you know, they sit whatever six feet apart or, or 12 feet apart. Um, and then they have guy talk. Um, and so for me, I'm comfortable. I don't feel like he's, you know, bringing anything into the house. And for me, it's, I, I really actually, you know, enjoy doing grocery shopping, which sounds really strange, but it's true. Um, but I know that the risk of doing that is quite high with Gord if I'm sort of doing any kind of window shopping, which is and the risk for me as well. So being able to find out what needs need to be met and find ways to maybe make a compromise because living with other people, it's just always a compromise, right? So yeah. um, that's sort of sort of, I don't know if that made sense, but uh, that, that's the other thing that I would, I would say if you're trying to sort of find a happy medium. And, and I think what that really highlights as well is that, that actually what you're doing is exploring why, you know, the, the, um, the uh, suggestions are not being followed for social distancing. So mm -hmm. sometimes presenting people with the statistics just makes them dig their heels in more. Yeah. So, yeah, and then it, and it becomes an intellectual argument as opposed to, exactly. saying, I, you know, I want my freedom. And it's like, okay, well, can we do it so that you, I respect that you need a sense of freedom and you respect yeah. my need for a sense of safety. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. This next question comes in from somebody who runs a support group for family members of people with mental health problems. Um, and the question is specifically about um, a family member whose partner was hospitalized for mania, now in an episode of depression, but back at home. And any tips for how that family member can support that person currently who's quite severely depressed? I can, I can speak from uh, personal experience from just uh, a couple, you know, the last 
few weeks is uh, I, Gord had been very um, supportive in terms of really encouraging me to keep to a routine. So it goes back to what you were saying, Fee, about, um, you know, noticing I know that I tend to sleep far more than I need to when I'm depressed. Um, and so really um, setting uh, an agreement that, okay, I'll, I'll get up at this time, I'll go to bed at this time. Uh, and he was very good at encouraging me to go for a run when I really, really, really didn't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the things he said that was so uh, caring to me was he said, I want you to be well. And somehow that it didn't, it, it didn't make me feel ashamed. It didn't make me feel like I wasn't working hard enough. It, it gave me a sense of how much he cared about me. And also that he knew that I could get well. And, and that kind of supportive comment uh, coupled with, that's why I want you to go for a run, <laughs> sort of made it a little bit more appealing. And then it, it momentum started to take over. And so, you know, it was one of those things where when someone was able to care for me before I could care for myself, and then I was able to jumpstart that. Um, and, and for him to set boundaries around his own limits. Um, so that was, that was really important too, um, so that I took responsibility to the best that I could, um, without blaming myself. I don't know if that's, what, a, what are your thoughts, Fee? I mean, I, th I think, you know, so, so exercise for, is, is such a, a fabulous way to manage mood. I, and, you know, there's a lot of data to support that. I guess for some people, you know, when your mood is really low, one of the things that also happens, obviously, is that your motivation becomes really low and, and it sounds like that was happening for you. And sometimes going for a run is just too difficult. Yeah. So, so maybe there's something about thinking, you know, what, what, does, what does this person generally do to stay well? And what would be a kind of um, an easy version of that? So if there's someone who usually runs every day, what about going for a walk every day instead? And is it something that they might find easier to do if you went with them um, or if you kind of went for a bit of it with them or, you know, and so it's, it's kind of the same things around having a schedule, having some mastery and pleasure in your day, but, but really trying to make sure that they, the tasks are, are, are doable. And so that actually people, because you just need a small sense of achievement, you know, manage to go for a walk and then, escalate into eventually getting back to going for a run but sometimes we set those the standards and, and we want to get back to our routine and when we fail to do that we feel like we failed and it can actually just continue to exacerbate the depression so mm. I think it's helping people set set routines and goals but making sure they're kind of you know really manageable yeah for me it was really important to set myself up for success and so before that even first run, it was that we went for a walk in the forest with the dog and, and, yeah. then, and it was short and it was like, just, can I get in the car? And am I able to just put my running shoes on? And seriously, because putting my running shoes on at the time, it made me think, oh God, I have to go for a run. And no, all I had to do was get in the car and he was going to drive. So the biggest thing was just putting on my seatbelt so I could do this. <laughs> yeah. And it sounds like what he did really well was also showing that he was on your side. And, yeah. and you know, when when people are depressed, I think one of the, the cha real challenges is that you're, you're aware that it's frustrating for the people around you. And that becomes another stick to beat yourself with. You know, I must be really irritating everyone. They must be fed up with me. And, and actually being able to just you know show someone that you understand that this is not something they can just snap out of and that you you realize that they're trying their best is really really important yeah we have time for one last question i'll ask you to keep your answers to sort of under a minute um so that we have some time to wrap and provide people with some resources at the end um, but this is a good question to end on. It actually talks about um, this person seeing some anecdotal reports of people actually doing better with their mental health during lockdown. Does that resonate with you? Have you heard of similar experiences? Uh, for, for myself, initially it did. 
because uh, I felt like I had a chance to uh, slow down and I could take things uh, one step at a time. Um, it, recently though, I've recognized that I've had to really create some intentional social contact um, with friends and sort of outside my primary relationship. And sometimes that's been really difficult. Um, but as that's happened, then I, I'm starting to feel sort of more myself. Um, but I can see that, you know, having that social support at home um, and because you're living with someone um, can actually be a, a protective factor and allow people to do well. And, and just to add to that is I, I've really noticed people sort of struggling to, to um, or feeling guilty about saying, actually, this has had a lot of benefit to me. So, you know, stopping the rat race, stopping all the 101 activities you generally have to do in a day, really being able to smell the flowers and, and hear the birds and, you know, spend time with your kids who you might not see as much as you'd like to. And I think there are some real benefits to this and it's hard to know how to experience them because they come alongside an awareness of all the the tragedy at the same time and i think that's quite a difficult um you know they're quite difficult to hold in parallel um yeah but i think for for some people that the mental health benefits will, will be and, and part of it's thinking what do we take away from this into the future you know this this is short term and it it won't last forever and you know are there things that we can that we can learn about our own mental health and and what we need that actually we can we can take forward that could have some long-term benefits as well as the short-term ones i think that would be a good topic for one of our future events actually Mm -hmm. Let's move into, before we run out of time for the session, we're going to keep this to an hour. Let's move into some resources and tools to leave people with. And we'll have a few slides to show you. I'll just go quite quickly through this, just as a reminder that the Bipolar Wellness Center by Crest BD has a section looking at social relationships and tools and resources within that area that you can access. Our quality of life tool also measures how you're doing in terms of your relationships over time. So if this is an area that you'd like to monitor in terms of quality and your satisfaction with your social relationships, that would be something that you could use. And on our Crest BD website, which is the academic home for our research, you'll find previous recordings of these prior Talk BD events that we've had as well as a survey uh, that we're doing currently um, asking people to give us information and knowledge on apps for bipolar disorder they're using currently. Details of the previous Talk BD events and other um, items like blogs. This one is from Ivan Torres, a Crest BD member um, who's been blogging this week on uh, and actually providing playlists for different music track lists for anxiety can be accessed there as well as details of our next event. This is gonna be happening in two weeks time, April 30th, again, a Crest BD Spectrum collaboration. And uh, this one is gonna be Stephen Jones talking about um, managing and monitoring substance use during these times in terms of also alcohol use. Again, that will be at seven o'clock UK time, two o'clock Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. And these are the links to Victoria as previous uh, talk BD events, which have looked at anxiety management specifically. We also wanted to use these opportunities to share really cool resources and tools as we come across them that come from outside of our individual networks. And we just love this one. It's developed by Maddie Pieces. She's the animator for it. It was produced in uh, collaboration with Council Learning, which is a US based organization focusing on facilitating, facilitating mental health education in schools. It's a really fabulous video. So if you're looking to support uh, younger people during these times, we'd encourage you to link uh, to check that out. We'll provide the link in the Zoom for you to that. And to you, Fiona, just to talk to people a bit about Spectrum and what you provide in terms of resources. Um, so at Spectrum, we've been doing um, some work, particularly around families. So we've developed something called the Relatives Education and Coping Toolkit, which has a funky acronym of REACT. And this was co-developed with relatives of people who um, have psychosis or bipolar disorder. And it's got lots of 
modules and videos and all kinds of um, resources in that you can access that just really um, give people some ideas about how to, to support somebody. Um, and that's free to access on the website. Um, and yeah, I hope it's useful. And of course, we need to thank our funders and support supporters for helping us put on this series of events, in particular, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And we'll leave you with a slide that shows you all the places that you can go to for the websites that we've mentioned today, Facebook, uh, Twitter, etc. We have a couple of minutes at this point. So I just wonder, Fee, Victoria, if there's anything that you wanted to share at the close of this. This was a great event, wonderful questions that came in from the audience. But thank you to everybody who participated. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I just um, I just want to echo what Fiona said is that uh, putting it in perspective that this is uh, short term, it's, this isn't going to last forever. Um, and just um, giving ourselves sort of some wiggle room that we're doing the best we can and focusing on the things that we're doing well, both ourselves and our families, I think can go a long way um, to creating a sense of um, unity while we're sort of moving through this together. And I'd just like to say, it's been great. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, it's great to work with Chris BD. Um, and my, my um, final word would just be, just lower your standards. <laughs> I think <laughs> the best way to be kind to yourself is lower your expectations. <laughs> yeah, so what I'm hearing is, uh, you, know, you know, this too shall pass. Yeah. Stay connected and stay pragmatic at the same time yeah yeah absolutely thanks for sharing with us today thanks to both of you stay well everybody and we hope to catch you again in a couple of weeks bye everybody thanks Aaron. bye, bye.